My name is Lyle Murphy. I'm the founder of the Alternative to Med Center, and today we're going to be talking about antipsychotic withdrawal, probably one of the most difficult medication withdrawal topics. The first question is how do antipsychotics work? Basically, at any sort of nerve synapse where one nerve is talking to another, you have a part that holds the neurotransmitters, and you have a part that receives the neurotransmitters called the receptors. So basically, how an antipsychotic works, most antipsychotics are meant to block dopamine. So dopamine never even gets a chance to get out over here. Now dopamine is your reward neurochemical. Not enough reward and you have lethargy, life is lackluster, you don't have any drive. Uh, it's sort of like the chemical equivalent of pursuing intimacy, pursuing a job well done, pursuing an educational pursuit, or just something out there in the world that is attractive to you that you're going to move in the direction of. Now too much of that and everything becomes rewarding and it looks like mania. And so basically most antipsychotics block that dopamine so that the excess dopamine is sort of shut down. But what happens with that is there's a phenomenon called antipsychotic induced dopamine receptor supersensitivity. And what that is is a big jumble of words that basically means if you're blocking dopamine from here, right, the body's natural tendency is to find some sort of balance. So dopamine also helps you hold your spine erect, keep your head level to the horizon, helps with your awareness of things in your environment, and these are very important survival attributes to um, staying alive. So your brain is going to try to figure out ways to get that same amount of input despite the fact that there's a drug holding back the dopamine. So what it does is it builds more dopamine receptors. And so instead of having just a couple, you have many, many. So the little bit of dopamine that's getting through has a higher chance of exciting something. So that can cause long-term dependence on antipsychotics and also can make the withdrawal very challenging, which we probably will go into here in another question. Next question, what is the difference between first generation and second generation antipsychotics? So the first generation antipsychotics like Thorazine and Haldol, they found that they had a high preponderance of neurological implications, up to 7%. And these neurological implications were serious, like tardive dyskinesia, which by and large is, I wouldn't say permanent, but it is certainly stubborn as far as having those symptoms go away once you start to develop them and they've really sort of taken root into your nervous system. The next generation of antipsychotics were meant to limit that effect. So for instance, out came Zyprexa, Clozaril, uh, Bilify, and these second generation antipsychotics have less of a neurological derangement to them, but they also have a higher preponderance of things like cardiovascular issues and interfering with insulin so that you put on a lot of weight. Really, these are the type of medications that have quite a huge impact as far as long-term side effects. And also, this, the second generation didn't eliminate tardive dyskinesia, it just lessened it to a certain degree, but they still, you know, it's still a consideration for a lot of people that take any type of antipsychotic. Next question, are antipsychotics effective at lowering a person's risk of a tragic event? Yes, absolutely so. Unfortunately, in our society, we don't have much of a mechanism for when a person is acting weird in our environment. If they're, you know, running up to people and saying weird things, you know, society is going to have a backlash on that. And also, you know, people can be a danger to themselves when they think they can fly or they think that God's talking to them. And I'm saying this because I've been there and I know. And antipsychotics are very um, effective at shutting that down. And if we had a mechanism in our society where we could put people in a safe place where they couldn't hurt themselves and fed them organic food and talked to them and had a relationship with them and all of the people in their family and like tried to help work through certain things, there would be a much more natural evolution of integrating some of these challenges um, that would be much, much more effective than antipsychotic drugging. However, in our society, what we have is antipsychotic drugging. And in the very initial phases, antipsychotics have been shown to reduce the liabilities of death, homicide, and suicidality. Next question. Are antipsychotics effective long term? Well, antipsychotics have been around for 60 years. These neuroleptics have had a birthday, I believe, uh, for 60 years in 2021. And there's nothing 
in the literature to show that there's long-term benefits from taking these type of medications for most people. Haro and his colleagues did a long-term outcome study. They followed people for 20 years. And what they found is that after two years, people with the same diagnosis, like the schizophrenic or schizoaffective diagnosis, the people that took medications and continued to take those medications for over two years had a six times increased chance of being rehospitalized after, you know, for the duration of their life, whereas the people that didn't continue with their medications had six times less. So that goes back to the phenomenon we talked about, how the dopamine receptors upregulate. They get more sensitive to dopamine, so eventually the drug's not doing anything anymore, and if you alter the drug, you get a flood of dopamine that hits these excessively volatile receptors, then the person can very quickly go into psychotic and manic states, which then gets them hospitalized, and there's sort of this whole circle of being medicated and hospitalized that pretty much persists until the person passes. Next question, are there better candidates for antipsychotic withdrawal? So with most maladies of a mental health nature, one of the entry questions for differentiating not only the diagnosis, but potentially the outcome, the prognosis, is are the symptoms constant or are they intermittent? Someone who has constant symptoms that has been responding to internal stimuli, that has had voices in their head, that haven't basically had any relief in a decade, their chances of coming off the medication and suddenly snapping out of it and going off and pursuing a college education and being a superstar is a lot less than a person who has intermittent symptoms. People who have intermittent symptoms, especially psychosis, one of the things I've said, if it works some of the time, it ain't broken. And this is important because when a person's high functioning mixed with complete train wreck, there's a reason why that's happening. And the discovery of the reason is where the magic is. And if you can you know, put on your Sherlock Holmes cap and investigate that and figure it out, the whole situation can unwind and, and rectify itself. That's the target population that we really do well with is what you would call the schizoaffective or the bipolar population. Because strangely enough, that's the population that the medication seems to work the best on. Because if somebody has an organic brain damage, in other words, they've got a lesion in their brain or something, the medications don't fix that, right? They may fix the symptoms that are associated with that, but you still see the vestiges of that problem and the person is rather low functioning. The people that, oh my God, you know, they're kind of acting normal because of the medication, those are the exact same person and if they regulated themselves right, they could probably be free of the medication and not have to endure the, you know, the side effects. Another analogy I use is that like some of the things that trip up psychosis, number one, I'm waiting for people out there to guess what is number one. What is the number one reason why people show up in a hospital or a psychiatrist's office in mad, acute psychosis? Marijuana use. Marijuana use in 75% approximately of the people that we end up admitting is the precipitating agent for someone ending up psychotic. Now, why is that? Why does one person go psychotic and another person doesn't off of marijuana? Well, marijuana is actually a more complicated chemical than let's say methamphetamines, cocaine, or even heroin. It's fat soluble. Other things like alcohol, you know, Enough alcohol will get just about anybody drunk. I mean, I'm sure there's a few people that just are numb to it, but essentially it's a solvent. It's going to wash out of your system because it's water soluble and it'll come out your kidneys. Marijuana ain't like that. Marijuana is fat soluble. You need an enzyme in order to break that fat soluble cannabinoid down into a water soluble form so you can basically detoxify it and expel it. If you don't have those genetics to do that, that chemical then builds up in your system just like, you know, fat does, and it ain't going nowhere until it's biotransformed. And a high enough concentration of THC will make anyone psychotic. They've done, you know, chemical warfare trials where um, they sprayed Navy SEALs with 100% THC, and 100% of them were completely psychotic. These are big, strong dudes, you know. As the accumulation of marijuana and cannabinoids go up in a person's system, faster than they can actually clear it, there's a tipping point where they go psychotic. And um, those people should not be smoking pot. If you've got a Lamborghini, you don't drive it down a dirt road, right? 
and you drive it down a dirt road and the bumper falls off, you think to yourself, well, maybe I shouldn't drive my Lamborghini down the dirt road. It's not a Jeep, you know? And you drive it on the appropriate road. But unfortunately, especially with our younger adults that just can't quite put those connections together, they keep driving the Lamborghini down the dirt road and it keeps ending up in the body shop. And really the only problem was marijuana. Does everybody have that reaction? No. Let me go back to the last question, actually. Better candidates for antipsychotic withdrawal. So there are some people who, because of their particular symptomatology, and maybe to some degree their personal choices, that they're not willing to angel up on certain uh, levels, there are those people that have a higher quality of life for as they see it and as they're willing to embrace on a modest amount of medication. And when somebody goes to the hospital, what ends up happening is they dump a huge amount of medications on someone and then they stay stuck at that level and never really like get to the place where, oh, maybe we can reduce those medications to a place where there's some kind of balance. If you've got a medication that's literally robbing your reward, I mean, imagine having a feeling that persists all the time where you never have any motivation for life at all. You don't want to read a book. You don't want to watch a movie. You don't want to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. You don't want to do school. You don't care. You can't care. On a physiological level, you don't have any motivation to even care. Just imagine what that feels like for a minute. That's what these medications feel like for these people. So what do they want to do? They want to rapidly stop the medication, which rapidly stopping an antipsychotic will almost invariably land you in the hospital again, or they want to do something to self-medicate their way out of it, some kind of stimulant, methamphetamines, coffee, drinking a bunch of caffeine and rock stars. And if you're on a truckload of medications, you might be able to tolerate that kind of behavior. But if you're also combining that with stopping your medications or yeah, stopping your medications, it will definitely turn itself into a big problem. So finding that sweet spot for even the most challenged people is a lot better than just dragging people until they're non-symptomatic. You know, it's, it's not necessary to do that to people. It's really kind of cruel in many ways. And there are options for even the worst people to get at least a modest balance at life where they're having the highest functioning and the lowest amount of symptoms. What do antipsychotic withdrawal symptoms look like? Typically they look just like psychosis, especially if it's going too fast. So even people, and I just interviewed somebody that's a success story that she had gone to prison and she wasn't psychotic, but they put her on Geodon. Well, when she tried to get off the Geodon five years later, she was going into psychosis and going into the same things that you would expect somebody with a schizophrenic or schizoaffective diagnosis to have. But it was medication induced. So when a person's coming off an antipsychotic, they're getting a flood of dopamine. Suddenly everything's going to be more exciting. And if it's done slow enough, that excitement can be channeled into certain things, preferably into things that are putting the attention outside on the world, not on things inside. Like for instance, things inside might be reading spiritual or religious material and pondering God, listening to repetitive music over and over and over again uh, that has that dit -dit 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 kind of beat, getting onto your crypto account and trading crypto, meditating, I mean things that are putting you inside of your head during this particular antipsychotic withdrawal time, it's not the right lens. So when that energy starts coming up to be more attractive, the world starts looking a lot less lackluster, that's a time to exercise, that's a time to play ping pong, that's a time to go out and play basketball, that's a time to do some extroverted your attention out there because everything in here is going to be kind of scrambled, you know? I don't even think like psychotherapy or deep counseling during an antipsychotic withdrawal is technically appropriate. Appropriate later, maybe even appropriate while you're on medications, but not when you're in the midst of withdrawal, it's just not the right formula. So the antipsychotic withdrawal symptoms typically look like, and if it gets to a point where, you know, there's, there's the fairway and then there's the rough area, I guess, or the white line and the, the ditch, like where it's starting to go off into the ditch looks like a person gets stuck on a thought that they cannot be redirected from, whether it's religious or, you know, the neighbors next door, maybe you're, you know, devil worshipers or something, like something that they can't really be easily redirected from. That is an indication that the withdrawal is probably going too fast and you need to slow it down. Not sleeping, not eating, or other red flag warning signs. So when that's happening, that is a time to pump the brakes. So just like if you're driving a huge logging truck down an icy road, there are times where letting up on the antipsychotic is like pressing down on the accelerator. 
So there's times where you need to use the brakes strategically. And if it's sliding off the cliff, that's the time to hit the brakes like, like almost to a full stop and gain control of the situation so that you can make it down the mountain without having to tumble down the side of it. Next question, can I cold turkey antipsychotics? I mean, yeah, you can, you can, you can step off the edge of a 10-story building if you want, but it doesn't mean you're going to fly. If you want to get hurt, that's a good way to do it. If you've only been on it for, I mean, I wouldn't recommend you stop antipsychotics unless there's some really, 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 there's a situation that's happened, you know, where you're having true, not just feeling lackluster, but you're, you're having some sort of strong reaction to the medication. Even if you've only been put on it for a few days, you want to probably take a few more days and try to get off of that and just make sure that you're in the clear before you go completely medication free. Because one of the things that can really be discouraging is trying to come off medications too fast, then ending up in the hospital and being convinced that you need to be on those medications for life and having your whole family believe that you need to be on those medications for life because look what you did. You did blah, 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 blah. You drove a car down the wrong side of the freeway. There's, you know, sort of a constellation of people that are like, you need these medications. It's not necessary to throw somebody into complete and utter chaos to get them off these antipsychotics. You can do it slowly, you can do it with strategy, and that's the best way to do it. I would not recommend a cold turkey antipsychotics, especially if it's prescribed for psychosis. If you're taking 50 milligrams of Seroquel for sleep, can you go off of that? Probably. Might be better to do 25 for a little while and then go off. But if you were put on antipsychotics for any type of psychotic feature, even if it's marijuana induced, you want to step down on that stuff slowly. And we'll probably talk about that in the next question, which is, what is a proper rate of tapering? In some ways, the question is like asking, what is the proper way to paint a Rembrandt? You know, there's brush strokes and then there's a true artistry involved here. So I can't tell a person what that is for each individual person. For one thing, there's genetic gateways for some of this stuff. So the dopamine upregulation we talked about, the tendency for the receptors to build just more receptors, swings from 37 to 98%. So there's at least a 37% uptick in the lower end and up to 98% increase in people that are just more sensitive to upregulation. So where on that spectrum do you fall? Would be a good question. A general guide, and this isn't necessarily the guide here. Okay, so the woman I just interviewed, five years on antipsychotics, we got her off in two months. Now, that's here. When you're talking about doing this at home, not everybody gets off antipsychotics in two months here that's been on it for five years. It's really case dependent. So the timeline, roughly speaking, and this is really rough, is about one month for every year you've been on the medication. Again, this is like walking down the stairs. If you're going down the stairs and you're starting to trip, you know, maybe you want to take less stairs, you know? Then you definitely don't want to try to fly off the roof because you're going to get hurt. So let's say you're on 30 milligrams of Zyprexa, you've been on it for four years. First thing you'd want to do is you want to preload your system with some of the supplementation we talk about. If you need some guidance on that, we have a webpage called Antipsychotic Alternatives on our website and it gives some suggestions. We'll cover some of those here later in the video. So you want to do that for a few weeks first. Get your diet straight, make sure that your blood sugar is not going up and down, stop the caffeine, don't be smoking pot, you know. If you're on a stimulating medication like Wellbutrin, that's probably got to go first. Then you would do an entry cut. An entry cut might look like, if you're on a high dose, higher dose of Zyprexa, you might get away with doing a five milligram cut. And you wait, and you see what that does. The normal person, I wouldn't say normal person, but there's like a acute withdrawal, and then there's more of a latent withdrawal for some people based upon their own genetics. But usually in two to three days, you're gonna start seeing some things. If you're gonna see a lack of sleep and lack of eating and ruminating thoughts, it's probably gonna be around day two and a half to day three. And it may start to abate itself by about day five to day seven. In some people, you might not even see that really come up for a whole week and it might last more than two weeks. Now, it also depends on if you're taking an injectable or you're taking an oral. An injectable is going to stay in your system a lot longer. You may not even see really the withdrawal from a month-long injectable for two months. So I'm going to just focus on the oral because most people that are doing withdrawal have to get transitioned to an oral anyway and won't be incrementally cutting down their 
and Jartable. So then you see how that went. And even if you have only been on medications for a short period of time, I wouldn't recommend cutting any faster than two weeks. So if you've only been on antipsychotics for a month, you're on 20 milligrams, and the rate of taper could be a lot faster with that. Maybe you go down to 10. But I would give it at least two weeks to just see what has happened there and make an evaluation. So for a longer term person, like the person who's been on for five years, they may have to sit with that for at least a month. And a good rate of tapering process is going to look like, you know, somebody has been on antipsychotics, they've been snowed over for a while, you know, and suddenly everything might be exciting again. They might want to, you know, get re-engaged in church, or they may want to go back to school, or they may want to, like, start dating. This energy can be channeled in certain ways and useful, as long as it's not kind of turning into hyperfixation. And use that. Use that energy to maybe do some things. I wouldn't suggest trying to get into college and do a hard scholastic coursework and obligations while you're trying to do an antipsychotic withdrawal. But you can do some things. You can go visit a college. You can go start thinking about it. You can, you know, check into their financial aid program or whatever. When all of this newness kind of dies down a little bit and things get a little bit boring again, that's probably the right spot to consider another medication taper. For most people, I mean, if you've been on it for five years, you really don't have to be in a big hurry. You just want to get to a place where life starts to feel good again. And then you use that energy to make life even better. And then when things get a little bit boring, then you start to cut down a little bit more and you just keep inching your way down and see how things go. Next question, how do I know if I'm going too fast? Well, as we mentioned, not sleeping and not eating means things have gone too fast. If you've had one night of bad sleep, but you got a little bit of sleep, you know, that's where you're starting to really look to see if you're still okay and balanced. If you didn't sleep at all, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, you're still going strong, you're probably going a little bit too fast. And there's ways to maybe either go back up on the medication a little bit or use a bridge type of medication to try to navigate through that. If you're going on your second night without sleep, it's like a four alarm fire thing. You need to shut that down because you don't want to end up back in the hospital. It's not necessary. And also if you get on perseverating thoughts that won't stop. I mean, some people might, you know, be at their church and decide they want to lead the the sermon for that day but I've seen it happen you know it it may feel god inspired and it probably is and also it might look a little bit unusual and um so if that kind of thing's happening it's okay to sit with that sort of sensation and not have to you know be like oh i need to save all these people right now because they're you know if i don't they're not going to be saved. Um, it's okay to sit with that for a little minute and just let that integrate a little bit and really just sort of stream that into your life. If it's coming too fast and you can't stop yourself from, oh, you know, taking this newfound energy and pushing it out in the world in a way that is going to um, cause ramifications, you're probably going a little bit too fast. If I need to reinstate because the symptoms are too much, what does that look like? This is a really good question, and this is a question that many people may not like the answer to, but anyway, so I've, I've been at this for 17 years, and um, I have um, learned to, I mean, it, you know, I was very idealistic in the first five years. I thought supplements could, you know, cure all of everything, and people didn't need meds, and you know, it, it, at some point, I got humbled and um, started to integrate, like, really, what's the best way to do this? So. Again, if you're if your truck sliding off the road and it's because you've got a foot on the accelerator, being that you've got more dopamine hitting the engine, it may not be a tap on the brakes situation. If you can't take that curve and you're gonna slip off the road and you're not sleeping, you're not eating, and if you went from, let's say on the other example we gave, you're, you're now down to 10 milligrams and you went down to 7.5 and you'd been doing like two and a half milligram cuts all along. So it may not just be going back up from 7.5 back up to 10 that really stops the truck you may have to go all the way back up to 20 or something get yourself to sleep stop the truck from going off the cliff go to sleep and when you wake up then you can consider going back down to 10 and maybe you go from 20 to 15 to 10 or you go straight to 10 that's up to you 
but um, you, you're not you're not reinstating it this high dose and losing all this ground. You're just trying to get keep the thing on the road so that you can continue to enjoy success in your tapering process. What going slower means like from that point, instead of going from 10 down to 7.5, maybe you go down to 8.75, which is a milligram and a quarter instead of two and a half milligrams down. Or maybe you do more of the adjunct therapies, such as the cardiovascular, which gets you more oxygen, vitamin C, niacin, maybe you up your lithium orotate or something maybe. Also, maybe you just put more time into being settled between tapers before you keep going down the road. Next question, what supplements or diet should I do when tapering? So primary things, marijuana might have served you when you were on antipsychotics. It might have given you some sort of relief from the tragic symptomatology you're feeling, from the side effects of the medication, but it's not going to work well when you're coming off these medications. It probably single-handedly could drive you to the hospital. So Xing that out. Next thing is if you're on any sort of stimulant. One of the worst things to do when you're doing an antipsychotic withdrawal is to take a stimulant. So that thing of coffee, again, might have served you when you were so anesthetized by medication that the world looked bleak. It might have given you some levity from that. However, doing that when you're on a razor's edge of your withdrawal, it very much will and can land you in the hospital. I'm not saying this lightly. There have been many, 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 many examples of people who've been in the middle of this tapering process that have drank coffee, that have drank monster drinks, anything with a lot of caffeine. I've even heard of chicken dumplings with MSG on it, which also is stimulatory, can derail the process. I'll give you a quick story. We had a kid over here that had been on antipsychotics for years, but before that he was a high functioning college student. Before he came into treatment, he was a product of the mental health system. And he started coming off these antipsychotic meds and he was doing so good. His family thought that we had waved a magic wand over him and that, you know, it was a miracle. So they wanted to take him out into Sedona and, you know, enjoy being with their son that they hadn't really seen much of for four years. And we said, okay, here's the diet recommendations. Don't, you know, drink caffeine. So they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they go to the hotel. Well, next thing they call us, I mean, we're talking within hours of him leaving the center and being stable for, you know, the duration of time he was with us. And they're like, Johnny is taking off all of his clothes and he's naked in the pool over at, I don't know, whatever, the Sedona Rouge Hotel. And we're like, did you give him coffee? They're like, no. We're like, what about the coffee machine in the lobby? Yes, he, he found the coffee machine in the lobby and um, drank coffee and it was an immediate and very abrupt return back into psychosis. Story turned out good, he got restabilized and obviously he learned his lesson in a controlled way. But I don't want you, if you're listening to this, to have to um, go through that same lesson unsupported. Other things that can help with this, so the challenge is how this works is these dopamine receptors have to downregulate. They have to go from this to that, you know? And that takes time. The, the major ingredient here is just time for your body to adjust to having a more normalized amount of dopamine. But there's a few things that sort of facilitate clearing and metabolizing extra dopamine. One of them is niacin. We put people on a pretty healthy dose of niacin over here, but 500 to 1,000 milligrams of niacin is something that would be an average for an at-home program. Vitamin C, vitamin C is one of the three cofactors in breaking down dopamine. So you have vitamin C, oxygen, and lithium, and we'll cover all three. So vitamin C, the proper amount of vitamin C is right below the place where it gives you diarrhea. So for some people that's four grams, for some people it's higher. Really that's the sweet spot. You just take enough of the powder, powdered vitamin C, in some orange juice or whatever you can mix it up in that makes it taste okay for you. and. If after a couple, three days, you're still pooping basically liquid, unformed bowel movements, then it's time to back off and find right below that point. Loose stool is okay, straight water, not okay. And that's called vitamin C to tolerance. The um, next thing is oxygen. How do you get oxygen? You exercise, get on a treadmill, beat that thing to death. I mean, at least spend a good 20 minutes a day getting on a treadmill and getting your oxygen levels up. Any sort of extroverted activity, going to play tennis, these are things that are going to get you more oxygen. Last thing is, is lithium. Now, lithium, the drug, is 
That's why it helps with mania is because it metabolizes dopamine. They've found that even in places where the lithium levels are minuscule in the water, we're talking parts per million, that there's less incidences of schizophrenia, homicidality, and suicidality. So does it really take 900 milligrams of lithium carbonate to do that? We don't think so. Maybe 40 milligrams of a more natural occurring version of it called lithium orotate. That's pretty instrumental to getting off of this. Now, if you're already on lithium carbonate, maybe you don't need to introduce the lithium orotate. You've already got lithium coming in there. And I would suggest doing the lithium after you do the antipsychotic withdrawal anyway, so you don't need to double down, but those are the three main ingredients. There's a lot more if you wanna to go to antipsychotic alternatives on the website. There are quite a few suggestions in there that um, were written by somebody I know very well, me. Next question, what type of things should I avoid during the taper? Um, I think we covered that good enough. Uh, next question, can antipsychotic withdrawal cause psychosis? Yes. Even if you didn't have psychosis, it was not a presenting feature of why you got put on antipsychotics. Um, if you got put on antipsychotics for sleep or you got put on antipsychotics because your antidepressants weren't working anymore so they decided to try something else, when you come off of these antipsychotics, you can experience psychosis. It is the withdrawal associated with this medication. Next question, once I'm off antipsychotics, what should I have available to me? There's a good little toolkit for, for this. And some of us, like me um, and most people, we already had some genetic dispositions that left us a little bit vulnerable and we wanna make sure that we have some, uh, you know, these are kind of like the everyday maintenance tools and these are like the box you bring out when things are like, you know, getting to a point where um, you might be having a problem again. Your lithium orotate, your vitamin C and your niacin and oxygen, really the, you know, primary strategies. Uh, also keeping your blood sugar stable. Blood sugar instability can take a emotional situation that was maybe a two or three and ramp it up to a nine or 10. If you're living off of cornflakes or frosted flakes in the morning and then like, you know, drinking coffee and you're probably not going to stay stable if you've had these kind of problems before you need to shift that up a little bit you got to get up and eat something first if you are a caffeine drinker of any sort you should eat before you drink caffeine it's not good for your physiology anyway even if you don't have psychotic features in your you know in your history but for people that have had psychosis really eating frequent meals something with the protein content whether you're vegan or a meat eater is important so get up eat breakfast start there and even if you don't eat again the rest of the day which is not advised at least you had something in your in, to keep your blood sugar stable if you're living off of sugar you're probably going to be living off antipsychotics again when you've discontinued an antipsychotic as much as you may want to throw that thing down the toilet and never see it again um i would suggest you keep a little bit around because in your path of walking towards holistic, non-medicated lifestyle, you may have a pothole or a place where, you know, there's a dip in the road where you need to pave over that spot. And it's good to have some backup stuff. So if you're starting to have some symptomatology creep up on you and you're rather familiar with it, and you've already tried all of the normative holistic means to try to avert that, having some Depakote on hand, just temporarily, just for a few days, a week, couple weeks, to kind of smooth over a certain spot. This is especially relevant for, let's see, how do I put this? There's, a, there's an enzyme called catecholamine methyltransferase that basically helps metabolize dopamine. If you've got an impairment, what's called a genetic polymorphism there, that may be a genetic reason why you start to spike dopamine. That also, uh, that COMT is also uh, instrumental in breaking down estradiol. So uh, in a female during her menstrual cycle can get a flood of estradiol and that in itself can escalate an artery underlying situation. So, you know, maybe during those times, a little bit of medication may be what it takes to keep you from running off the rails. And then if you are starting to um, seriously decompensate, it's okay to reinstate for a little while. So if you're not sleeping and you're going on day two without sleeping, it's probably better to take some of the medication you were prescribed before than it is to let it escalate to the point where you're at the hospital. You can shut it down and you can start over, you know, the next day or two days later 
and stay on track instead of having it turn into another crisis. Some of these navigation points are a little difficult to do without some sort of skilled family support or even some professional support. Sometimes people coach with me when these things happen and um, there's ways to navigate them, but being absolutely, I'm not gonna take medications again. There, there may be instances where you wanna challenge that notion. It happens. I mean, in your first year, if you've made it a year without being on antipsychotics that you've been on for a while, you're probably going to be okay. You can probably just maintain a good lifestyle and you're good. But in that first year, you might have some bumps in the road that do require you to back up and punt. And it's okay. Don't. It's not a loss. It's not you failed. It's you're still in the middle of a process. Next question. If the withdrawal is too difficult, are there bridge medications that will help? Yes. So. A lot of times people are not just on one, anti, one medication, particularly one antipsychotic. If you've been on antipsychotics, you're probably on a lot of medications. The other medications that you're on may serve as a bridge to help you get off the antipsychotic. Again, it's like painting a Rembrandt, but here's the brush strokes. If you're on Adderall or you're on Wellbutrin or you're on Effexor or you're on some sort of stimulating medication, like SNRIs, Wellbutrin, any of the ADHD medications, you know, Vyvanse, I mean, you'd be surprised how many times I see Vyvanse prescribed with an antipsychotic. One, one blocks the reuptake of dopamine so that you have more dopamine, and one is blocking you getting dopamine. It's, it's like, who, who's prescribing this stuff? It's kind of like hiring a professional driver to park your car in the garage and they slam on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. I mean, would you really want that person parking your car for you? Hell no. Like, whoever's prescribing that sort of stuff is clueless. They're what they're doing is they're, oh, you're too sedated. Let's bring you up a little bit and give you a stimulant. No, you're too sedated. Let's reduce your antipsychotic a little bit. I mean, that's the wisdom that, like, ugh. Doctors. <laughs> Once you've gotten rid of those stimulants, bridge medications that may help, like, if you're already on Depakote or you're already on lithium or you're already on even an SSRI like Prozac or something, um, probably better to leave those in place because those can actually help you with the withdrawal. I don't like using benzos for people that are coming off uh, antipsychotics. If you're already on a benzo, again, you might want to wait until later to do that part after the antipsychotic because you're already taking them anyway and the benzos actually might help with some of the withdrawal symptoms. Kind of my go-to over here is either Depakote or Gabapentin. Gabapentin is I mean, it's not completely innocuous, but it's very much like a prescription supplement. It's GABA attached to a pentane molecule. GABA is a naturally occurring substance, unlike a toxic poison. It's a little bit of pressure on the brake when you're pushing on the accelerator coming off an antipsychotic. Depakote, a little bit stronger. It does have a bit of a toxic profile, especially at higher dosing levels. But, you know, 500 to 1,000 milligrams of Depakote, if you're stuck in a certain spot and you can't go any lower, might help you get through that spot and get off the antipsychotic where maybe you couldn't without it. Some practitioners that are even engaged in the practice of medication withdrawal, the tendency is to like, oh, you've got four medications, let's cut that down to one. So let's say you're on Prozac, Depakote, Trileptal, and Clausrol. Well, you can get rid of those other three really easy and you're still on the Clausrel, right? But was that, did you really, like Clausrel is going to pretty much pave over everything. Whereas those other medications, you're not going to really notice if they're gone because you're on so much Clausrel, right? So it looks like they did something wonderful, but realistically, they probably painted you in a corner where now going through the the mechanics of the antipsychotic withdrawal may be too much for you to be able to handle that storm. Whereas if you'd kept those other medications on board while you're doing it, it might have been more tolerable. So the hierarchy on things looks like get rid of the stimulants, reduce the antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, you know, and the mood stabilizers may help with the withdrawal, honestly. So some of those other medications may help in the bridge. The next question was, if I'm on multiple medications, which medication should I do first? I think we already covered that. Now, I guess I could get into that a little bit more because this is where the this is where the breaststrokes kind of meet the artistry in that. Definitely get rid of the stimulants if you're doing an antipsychotic withdrawal first. Maybe, sometimes, sometimes. If you're on a lot of antipsychotics and, you, and the stimulants were the only bright hope that you saw in any of that, you take away the, the stimulants, and suddenly you're so anesthetized you can't even function. Maybe, and this is rare, but maybe 
do a little bit of both at the same time. Say you run 30 milligrams of Zyprexa and you run 70 milligrams of Vyvanse, and then you get off the Vyvanse at the same time you're getting off the Zyprexa down to about 15, and then the Vyvanse is gone, then you continue going on the Zyprexa. Different for everybody. That is not a strategy that's typically employed here, but occasionally. If you've only been on a medication for a short period of time, and it's not really helping the whole composite of things, like, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of the antihistamine type drugs. There is even some suspicion that they cause psychosis. Uh, we call it a low histamine psychosis. So I'm not a big fan of those. You know, if they've been prescribed for a short period of time, maybe you can just X those out. Um, if you're on three different antipsychotics or two in a different antipsychotics, if the first antipsychotic wasn't effective and they put you on a new one, and the new antipsychotic is effective for whatever it's supposed to be doing as far as like, you know, keeping you from uh, experiencing manic symptoms, then you could maybe get rid of the other medication. But one of the kind of typical things to do is, is to, if you've only been on a medication for a short period of time, you just got prescribed it at the hospital, and um, it's really new, maybe those medications can go first, even if it is a mood stabilizer. Anyway, it's a bit nuanced. Hopefully some of those strategies, you know, help you navigate through it and you can talk it over with your prescriber as to what the best strategy might be. Okay, next question. Does your brain go back to normal after antipsychotics? I guess it depends on what your definition of normal is. My brain hasn't been normal. And there's certain places that, you know, I or other people have to navigate. But generally speaking, yes. If a person has the more labile dispositions of the schizoaffective or the bipolar sort of presentations and they normalize and they're calling that normal, then yes, you um, typically can regain those states pretty easily. If somebody has an organic brain lesion, a traumatic brain injury, and uh, or they're on the spectrum or something, and you take away the medications, was it the medications that are causing everything? Mm, probably not. Um, there may be some other sensitivities that that person has and but yeah I think this part of the question is can you go back to normal after these drugs by and large yes it may take some time and it may require some strategy but uh, the brain does have an amazing capacity to heal from poisons that it has been on next question can withdrawing from antipsychotics cause psychosis uh, that there wasn't previously there. I think we covered that. Absolutely, yes. It's a very common phenomenon that eludes a lot of people. They think, how did I go psychotic all of a sudden? I wasn't, didn't have these problems when I was in my 20s. You know, they're like coming off of Seroquel or something in their 50s and they're like, I'm going crazy. It's withdrawal. How long does antipsychotic withdrawal last? On an oral medication, you should probably see the withdrawal start 36 hours, more like two and a half to the third day, which would be probably about 60 to 72 hours after the withdrawal. And that's when you see generally the most pronounced aspects of the withdrawal and things should start to get settled down within a couple of weeks. And of course, some people need a lot longer than that, but that's sort of the acute pattern of the withdrawal. Next question, what is the primary reason that patients stop taking antipsychotic medications? Because life just, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like carrying a cross, you know? It's like you literally are burdened with having absolutely no reward in life. Who wants that? And plus, most, most antipsychotics make you overweight. You know, packing on 40 pounds is, is um, pretty disheartening. And... Um, it, you know, having that, uh, if you ever look at people that have been on in, in the psychotics, they, the, the spirit in their eyes seems to disappear, or at least go into remission. It comes back, you know, but that's the main reason. And what the, the pitfall is, is that um, they want to get off their medications now. And especially if they're starting to feel better coming off their medications, they don't want to reinstate. They tip over into psychosis, and then they get forced medicated. And that's the situation I was in. I was forced medicated, you know, tied down, injected, all that stuff. And um, it really just was a bad strategy around um, the withdrawal. Last question, is Abilify withdrawal different than other antipsychotics? I did want to cover that. Abilify, so 
You've got the dopamine antagonists. In other words, they block dopamine. That is the majority of your antipsychotics. You have lamictal, which blocks glutamate. It's slightly different. They call it a mood stabilizer, not an antipsychotic. But it's going after another excitatory neurochemical called glutamate. Well, Abilify is this weird drug that it might block dopamine or it might actually make dopamine more effective. So that's why they've classified it as more of a mood stabilizer to help regulate, you know, bipolar. And at higher doses, it tends to be more sedating and more dopamine blocking. But as you reduce the medication, it actually might be more stimulating. So you go from 30 down to 20, down to 10, down to 7.5, and then you get down to five and you're like, all of a sudden the person's like escalating and you think it's because they're on too little medication. And it might actually be that the medication itself had paradoxical effect of stimulating them. So Abilify withdrawal, usually the least complicated out of all of the uh, antipsychotic class, but sometimes the lower you get on that medication, you might see you might see the medication itself sort of spike things. Anyway, that is the end of our questions on antipsychotics. I know this has been a long video. Thank you so much for um, spending time with me. And hopefully the information takes you a bit further in your journey. Um, I do want to put in there that what I'm telling you is not to be considered medical advice. Um, even though I actually guide a lot of psychiatrists on how to do these type of withdrawals. One, I don't know you and you don't I can't tell you what to do without having uh, a real visit with you. So I would suggest that if you need a medical provider to talk to, that you go on to the immh.org and find yourself an integrative mental health doctor, hopefully in your area, that can help guide you, at least in your state. Make the travel to wherever they are. They can probably continue a relationship with you once they've had a first inpatient contact and can maybe help guide you in this process in a way that actually takes you and your personal situation into account. Thank you very much and have a good day or night. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. For information about Alternative to Med Center, give us a call at 888 984-9667.